Hello everybody and welcome back to the philosophy of religion. In this lesson we're going to be continuing our study of the traditional arguments for the existence of God and we're going to talk about the third of these arguments which is the teleological argument or the design argument. And we're going to talk about what are teleological arguments? How do they um, operate within uh, within philosophy? What kinds of things? How do they look? For example, well, then we're going to start talking about a number of specific examples of teleological arguments. For example, we're going to talk about Aquinas's. We'll talk about William Paley and the analogy of the watch, which is arguably probably the most uh, famous of the teleological arguments. And then we're going to talk about critiques of the teleological arguments, just like with our other. Um, studies, we, we can explore the critiques of these arguments as well. So let's begin by talking about basic, um, the basic structure of a teleological argument. What kind of things does a teleological argument do to try and show that the existence uh, for the existence of God? Well, they're sometimes known as design arguments, as I've just mentioned, and the purpose is to look at the end result of um, of of a certain thing, the telos of a particular thing, to infer the conclusions from that. Now, this means that there are inductive arguments and that therefore there are also a posteriori arguments. So they're not a priori arguments, they're not um, deductive in nature, they are inductive and a posteriori. Now, this means that we're talking about evidence and we are looking at the world um, from an empirical perspective. We are seeing things within the world from a, an empirical perspective perspective and then from that we are inferring conclusions and the conclusions just like the conclusions with any argument for the existence of God will be uh, therefore God exists and this is the basic structure so we have premise one whenever we see things in the world that are complex ordered or beautiful and serve a particular purpose or function we can infer that they have been designed by some intelligent designer that is just a basic um, a basic premise for um, inferring a designer for the universe. Premise two, order, order, beauty, complexity or purpose do not arise out of chance. They have to be designed. That's the second premise. So this um, accounts for um, counter arguments to suggest that, well, yes, while things do tend to, we can infer things that could be designed, this is not necessarily the case. There might be examples where uh, things come out of um, pure chance and probability. This premise takes that um, counter argument out of the question and it says that, no, 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 no we can't just ha um, infer um, beauty, complexity and order in the universe out of pure chance and pure luck. It has to be designed. Premise three, if we look at the natural world, we also see order, beauty, complexity and purpose. So now we are taking what we believe about um, general things that we see in the world. So, you know, uh, things that are ordered in a particular way um, that we can infer some intelligent designer. And we're saying, hang on a minute. There's, if we look outside and we look at nature and we look at the universe and we look at all these things, these also seem to um, be complex and they seem to have a purpose and they seem to be ordered and beautiful. And so therefore, the natural world must have some kind of designer and therefore God exists. We can infer from premise four, um, or at least the first of the conclusions, which is the fourth uh, line here, that um, the universe has some kind of intelligent designer, therefore God exists in whatever form, in at least one variation of God, must exist. Let's continue. There are different variations of this argument. Some we'll look at in this lesson. The most uh, ancient example, one of the most ancient examples of the teleological argument, comes from um, Cicero in his work on the nature of the gods. And in this work, uh, a character called uh, Lucius uh, Bulbus asks... What could be more clear or obvious when we look up at the sky and contemplate the heavens uh, than that there is some divinity or superior intelligence? So we're basically, this is just summing up the teleological argument in its most basic, uh, in its most skeletal form, if you will. And we're just saying, look at the world, look at the, the heavens, look at the sky, look at nature and you have to therefore infer that there must be some kind of divinity. There must be some kind of superior intelligence that's designed this, that's, that's made this um, the way that it is. The teleological argument is is 
uh, popular because it appeals to our sense of aesthetics and our sense of wonder and beauty about the world. Most people, if not everybody, and if and uh, should be in awe of the world. They should be in awe of the beauty and complexity that exists in the universe. And if you're not, then there's something wrong with you because it is incredible. And so we therefore it makes sense to infer some kind of design from these arguments. But philosophically. And logically, there might be some criticisms with these arguments. But let's look at the specific examples of two major um, teleological arguments from um, philosophers in history. We'll talk about Thomas Aquinas in this slide, and then we'll talk about William Paley and his analogy of the watch. So in the last lesson, we focused on the first three of Aquinas's five ways, which were um, the ways in relation to the cosmological arguments. In this one, we're going to talk about um, his fifth way to show the existence of God from his work Summa Theologica. And because teleological arguments are relatively simplistic, they're not like ontological arguments where we're talking, um, you know, we're looking at quite a lot of different logical um, uh, things, different logical phrases and, and looking at uh, quite a lot of analytic philosophy to explain what we mean. In this, they're quite simple. So it's easy to get a little variation between them. And so therefore, this argument will seem to be very similar to that of William Paley and that of uh, all the other ones. Aquinas uses the example of archery to illustrate his belief that purpose in the universe is evidence for the existence of a particular god or particular divine uh, being. He suggests that nature seems to have order and purpose in it and that nothing inanimate is purposeful without the aid of a quote-unquote guiding hand. He argues that there is some guiding hand to the universe and this guiding hand can be described as god. And the variation of this argument can be seen in William Paley's analogy of the watch. This is probably the most easy to understand and most famous. So the design arguments that were at their height of popularity during the Great Enlightenment strides in scientific fields, because as more and more people started to discover things about the universe and about about the world that we lived in, in the Enlightenment, the more we we became convinced that there had to be a designer because the ways in which everything was just so perfectly designed. And so William Paley devised what is now the most popular argument from his work Natural Theology. And the most famous of his examples is that of a watch. And arguably this is um, possibly not even his analogy that he came up with himself, but this is only one that he repeated. However, it has been ascribed to him in history and for uh, forevermore it will be William Paley's analogy of the watch. He said that if one was to, in a thought experiment, if one was to see a watch lying on the floor on a heath, and they had picked it up and they were able to examine this watch and see the complexity in order and the ways in which all the intricate details and all the parts uh, fit together so perfectly to be able to tell the time each second perfectly. Okay, If somebody was to do that, one can infer from that watch, from looking at the watch, okay, that it hadn't just materialised out of nowhere on the heath. It hasn't just came into existence um, out of chance. It was designed by some intelligent designer. Nobody um, would um, see something like a watch, a pocket watch, for example, um, on a field, on a hill or a heath or whatever, and they would assume that it was made there naturally and it just came into a natural um, instincts. People assume that it was designed by some intelligent being and then maybe it was dropped and, you know, it was eventually lost. Well, this is the rational logic that one can infer from this situation as we uh, do as we discuss next to a, a picture of aquinas um so if one was to accept that the universe is similarly similarly um complex and seemingly ordered and purposeful in a similar way to the watch why would one not say that it too has an intelligent designer if we can look at the watch and we can say this is uh, obviously designed by some intelligent being, it didn't just materialise out of nowhere, out of chance, okay, and we are to suggest that the universe and nature and, and the, the natural world is equally as complex and equally as uh, purposeful and equally as um, intricate in its detail and complexity, then why would we suggest that on the one hand the watch was designed by an intelligent designer, but on the other hand the universe was not? 
Paley uses another example of the suitability of animals to the environments that they live. Um, this was a, a pre-Darwinian um, concept. And so therefore, from this, we can assume that because the world is similarly complex and beautiful, we can then make that analogy to um, suggest that, uh, that God exists and that God is this intelligent designer in the universe. This is how we understand the teleological arguments. And again, like I've already said, they seem to be intuitively quite convincing because they are very useful in their ways they appeal to our uh, in our innate understanding of aesthetics and our innate um, breathtaking um, awe of the of the universe and of the world if we are i'm in awe of the universe all the time and this can um, cause you to believe that there must be some kind of intelligent designer and with that let's look at some criticisms of the teleological argument there are a number of uh, criticisms that are of this argument um, a lot of them are very convincing. Firstly, we can just uh, we're going to go through some criticisms uh, from a general perspective, so the general criticisms of the teleological argument. Before we look at Hume's criticism, David Hume's criticism of William Paley's specific argument. So more generally, there are a great number of um, arguments. For the first argument being that the second premise of the teleological argument states that complexity and order do not appear by mere chance. However, it's not exactly clear how this has been demonstrated to be true. We only use um, the example of things that are man-made to uh, come to this conclusion. However, there's no evidence to suggest that the complex things um, can't appear out of chance just because we, our only reference point uh, at least seemingly at the moment, our only reference point is the kind of technologies and crazy things that we can um, design on Earth. The third premise also makes the claim that the universe is perfectly ordered and has some purpose. Again, what is the purpose of the universe? If we're talking about comparing uh, a watch in William Paley's argument to that of the universe... Well, we can say that the purpose of the watch is to be able to tell the time correctly, and it does that uh, in a very good way. It, it's perfectly intricate and, uh, and complex, and it's purposeful. But what is the purpose of the universe? What is that similar kind of purpose? The watch tells the time. What does the universe do? There's no answer to that question. There, we, there may be some um, religious answers to that question, but there is no um, objective answer to that question that we can objectively say yes this is the re this is the purpose of the universe so that that weakens the third premise and if the answer to this question is to harbor life if that's if that's the purpose of the universe then we can just reject the entire teleological argument on the grounds that it isn't very good at doing that because the majority of the universe is pretty uh, inhospitable to any life at all in fact we have possibly found uh, examples of uh, of planets in the universe that could harbor life but there is no evidence of any other life that exists beyond this planet so we could be literally the only um, ball of rock in the universe that harbors life so that wouldn't be a very good purpose for the universe and this just what i've just mentioned there however if one was to accept that there may be other life on other planets this would ultimately um it could uh, lead to uh, as 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 uh, accepting this third premise, but then we would have to reject most major religions because most major religions place Earth and humanity quite centrally in their in their religious doctrine as as an important aspect. And if the universe is full of life, then the argument for suggesting that that is the case is quite weak. And then we've got Hume's criticisms of Paley more specifically. One criticism. Uh, presented by Hume's was that his analogy of the watch and nature are, un are untenable. There is no way we can perfectly use the example of the watch and, and, and use that as an analogy for nature. He argues that the characteristics of purpose and design are obvious in the watch. We obviously know that that's the case, but they're not necessarily obvious in nature. And he even suggests that Paley implies this himself within his own arguments. Paley says that if you walk on a heath and you pick up a watch off the floor, you would notice it and you would pick it up and you would notice that there is a watch there, which almost suggests that it is an unlike nature. It is very different to nature because if it was just like nature, then you probably wouldn't have given it a second thought. The very fact that you notice the watch on the floor suggests that there is somehow different from nature so that the analogy cannot work. 
Finally, let's talk about John Stuart Mill's criticisms of the uh, teleological argument. Mill's criticisms of the argument are similar to our critique of the third premise that we, if you remember. So Mill argues that if we look at the world and the rules in, that govern the world, we see a lot of cruelty, we see a lot of violence, and we see a lot of unnecessary suffering against humans and against um, animals. Therefore, if the world was deliberately designed by God, this God could not be a loving God, as most religions, uh, major religions suggest. Therefore, there is too much unnecessary violence in the world, since there is too many uh, necessary violence in the world. And this is tangentially related to the problem of evil that we looked at in the last lesson. One counter argument could be presented that uh, one uh, that applies also to the problem of evil. Uh, maybe God designed the world full of evil and suffering to test people's um, faith, and obviously you can then show a number of different um, ways in which we can explain away the problem of evil. We can talk about different theodicies, insert whichever theodicy you want in that example, and um, that is something that we looked at in the last lesson. And a critique of this response could uh, it could lead one to point out that seemingly unnecessary suffering that goes on in nature and the natural world. It's just something that um, exists. And the question is, did God design tigers to hunt and kill other creatures because he wanted to test the creature's faith? Is that something that exists? That's a counter-argument to the counter-argument, effectively. So the idea of testing faith, is this something that we can apply naturally to um, animal, uh, the animal kingdom? And if we want to do more re research and further reading on the teleological argument, there are a number of ones we can talk about. So here, for now, here are some pieces of further reading you could talk about. You could talk about the influence of Darwinianism uh, and Darwinian um, scientific thought on the teleological arguments and how that has impacted the, the, the understanding of the teleological arguments. You could talk about Tennant and his anthropic principle, something that we will look at in a more advanced lesson. And then we could also talk about Swinburne's design argument as well. So there are other design arguments arguments that do try to get around these critiques. In the next lesson we're going to do is talk more specifically about Immanuel Kant and his moral arguments.